places. So if you look at these early human ancestors, they had these huge jaws, huge teeth, which they needed to just chew all day. Yeah. So as we started processing this food, our faces got a little flatter. Our nostrils, which used to be up like that, came down this way. And our mouths got a lot smaller. And without that chewing stress, our mouths very quickly grew so small that our teeth had nowhere to go. So they started growing and crooked. So if you look at an ancient skull, anything older than 500 years old, is a very good chance, about a 99% chance, perfectly straight teeth. James Nestor, thanks so much for coming on the show. Thanks a lot for having me. Yep, we had uh, some video issues in the past, but now we got everything settled and uh, we're ready to rock and roll. For now, things are settled. We'll see what happens in the next few minutes, but you know, for modern now, age, what can you well, do? I got, some, I got some wood here, so I'm gonna knock, knock on it just to make sure we're good to go. All right. Um, well, I'm really excited to have you on. I, um, I initially was keen on just digging deeper into what you were talking about with your with your book breath just because it's something i've dealt with my entire life and i feel like a lot of people are in a similar situation so i've had breathing issues ever since i was a little kid and i used to breathe with my mouth a lot and i would i would breathe with my chest almost instead of through my through my stomach and i realized there wasn't a lot of information that was out there i had asthma issues when i was little and I had deviated symptoms that I had to get an operation for. Uh, as I mentioned, I saw you on Joe Rogan, he had a similar thing, and it completely changed how I breathe, and of course, and how I can think and how I function. Uh, it really changed the way I look at breathing, and I haven't really dug into it ever since then, but I realized like if that kind of symptom can change my life in such a short amount of time, there's clearly a lot of value in what you're teaching so i'd love to know a bit more about like what got you into this world of breathing that few people seem to really talk about these days well i think most people take breathing for granted it's just something that we do it's something we do unconsciously if we're breathing that's good we're alive and if we're not breathing that's bad you know we're dead or we're unconscious so the subtleties of breathing the ways in which you breathe have such a huge dramatic effect on your health and well-being, your mental health, your physical health, longevity, on and on and on. And this was something I had no idea about. I'm, I'm a journalist. I don't come from a medical background. I've never written about anything of this sort before. But once I started getting into it and talking to experts in the field, I realized that there is this huge gap in our understanding of health. But most people know you need to exercise. Okay, that's, that's pretty well established. And now most people know you need to eat right. Mm. But you can exercise and you can eat right, but if you are not breathing properly, if you continue to breathe inadequately, you will never ever be healthy. And we're seeing this with weightlifters or ultra marathoners or various people who we view as being the pinnacle of health. They have chronic breathing problems and they suffer from very severe health problems because of that. Yeah, and you got into this because you were well, you wrote a book around free diving, I believe. And you were also a free diver. That was, that was kind of your world. And it kind of makes sense that I guess breathing became this next passion top topic that you had. Uh, but that's what you were doing, right? You were a free diver. Yeah. Uh, I had started a book called deep, which looked at the human connection to the ocean. So free diving was certainly part of it, but it was also looking at start at the surface, went to the very bottom of the Marianas trench and, and looking how we're connected to every single level both from um, a life perspective, to senses, to, to many other functions. So um, after that, uh, I, I learned how to free dive from free divers, not in the crazy going down 400 feet, you know, risking death, but just to understand what it was like to use your natural body to explore the ocean and to really get in touch. It's, it's like an underwater meditation when you're free diving because you're completely silent you're using only the air in your lungs and you're using 
just your body to propel yourself uh, very far down and, and there's no gravity down there. So I'll never be able to afford to go to space, but I can afford to, you know, hold my breath and, and go down past 30 feet where the buoyancy flips and you start gently drifting downwards. So these, these free divers told me, they said, well, breathing only by controlling breathing, can you hold your breath for five, six, seven, eight minutes at a time. But the applications aren't just tied to the ocean or to lakes or wherever you want to free dive. They're, they're also applicable throughout land. They can help heal your body. They can allow you to enter different states of consciousness and they can allow you to do things that have, we've been told are medically impossible. And so as I was researching and writing that book, I just kept filing away these other stories about breathing that didn't fit into that book. And finally, I had enough of those stories that I went out and started researching breath. And so free diving, uh, I should have probably looked this up, but I've, I've, I've heard of the term, but I don't actually know, is it, is, are you actually, do you have like a oxygen tank with you or are you just going fully down? That's crazy. Well, well, you should, maybe I shouldn't say that you do have an oxygen tank. You have an air tank. You have two of them and they're right here and they can hold about six liters of air and they are our lungs and they're the same air tanks that dolphins use and that whales use and that seals use. And we have the same reflexes that these animals have. So the moment you put your face into cool water, you can even do this at your sink. Your heart rate's going to lower about 20%. Blood is going to start shifting, uh, coming in from your extremities into your core, and you're going to enter this meditative state. That is not a placebo effect. It's called the mammalian dive reflex. And this is how uh, seals can stay down for 90 minutes at a time. Whales can stay down for an hour. Dolphins can stay down for several minutes. So humans have these reflexes too. And when you free dive, you feel these ancient reflexes, these senses waking up and coming on and it is a completely surreal experience to essentially become a different animal when you're in the water and the longest breath hold not at depth is about 12 minutes 12 and a half minutes so so the idea that in all of these things we have been told were scientifically impossible the body is going to collapse past 100 feet because of all that pressure pressure doubles within the first 30 within the first 30 feet in the first atmosphere and it keeps increasing the deeper you go mm -hmm. so you can bring a coke can down and it'll blow up at around 70 feet but the human body is just fine because it adapts the deeper and deeper we go and and that it's these mammalian dive reflexes that allow us to not only survive but to prosper down there at these very deep depths this body is created to dive deep and it's something that has just been, we've been doing this for tens of thousands of years. And in the modern age, we don't need to dive down in the ocean and get fish, right? You got a long john silvers or whatever. We don't need to do anything except sit on a couch. Wow. Now I'm fascinated by this because you're right. It seems like as humans can adapt as deeper that we go, is that something that you can train someone that perhaps have very low lung capacity, but through free diving and other things, you can train yourself to hold your breath for, from let's say for one minute, which is probably what I can do, maybe less, to five minutes. Is that something you can train yourself to do? I could get you to hold your breath about two and a half minutes, three minutes, and in, in about 30 minutes of, of training, to just what? waking up to... The... Anyone could do this. Some people can go four minutes. And, and this is someone in, in a healthy, someone who has a, a pathology, someone who has underlying conditions can't do this, but you seem to be a pretty healthy person. So, and this is a standard thing. We don't need to do this. So our bodies aren't acclimated to it. But when you start opening up the body and understanding its true potential, what we were really using it for before we were sitting in front of desks all day, you know, and talking on Zoom you start realizing that we've sold ourselves short for, for so long. And this really leads into breath as well, because just lung capacity, we were told that whatever organs we were given, especially in adulthood, that's what we got. You can't do anything about it. Your nervous system's automatic. You can't control it. Can't do, immune system is beyond conscious control. Uh, lung capacity, can't control that. All of that is garbage. And I'll show you. 500 resources that that show people that 
have done just this. So, so breathing and lung capacity is the easiest thing in the world at this freediving competition where I first I was writing about for Outside Magazine. There were tall people, short people, large people, small people, whatever, every walk of life. They all had these <laughs> huge chests because wow. they had expanded their lung capacity. Average male lung capacity, about six liters. Herbert Nitsch, a world champion freediver, has 12 liter lung capacity. So, so he was not born this way. By act of will, by loosening this musculature and by making this very flexible and breathing the way we're supposed to breathe, we can drastically change our posture. So much so that in the 1900s, this teenage girl who had scoliosis, severe scoliosis, breathed her spine straight. And there's x-rays of this and taught thousands of other women to do the same thing. So. It's so obvious, it's so in front of us that nobody thinks about the true power and potential of breathing. So you're saying someone can actually increase the size of their lungs to the point where from an exterior physical perspective, it would actually make their chest area look bigger. Absolutely. That is insane with, with, to me. With wow. No, no doubt. I mean, you're talking, your ribs flex. If you take in a big breath of air... You can feel your ribs flex, right? Yeah. If you put your hands down where the last two ribs are, taking a big breath of air, what you want is your hands to move out laterally, not just in the front. That is your diaphragm pushing down and gently moving those ribs out. And your body wants this because the diaphragm is the muscle that sits underneath the lungs. And when it pushes down, it gently massages the organs down there and helps them release lymph fluid. Hmm. So there's so much more to breathing than I'm getting oxygen into my tissues and that's good. This is a, it's a biomechanical act, it's a biochemical act, and, and doing it properly will affect you in, in so many ways. Yeah, I mean, I guess the, the kind of the conventional wisdom that probably most people also think is that at a, at a certain age, of course, when you're from a baby to when you're an adult, your organs will certainly grow as your body adapts and grows. But most people, I would imagine uh, that maybe at an age from 25 or 30, that your muscles can grow and your, your, your bones and your internal organs would seem static. But it's, it seems like that's not the case as long as you're able to exercise just like any other muscle you're exercising at the gym. Of course. And, and that's a great example with muscles. Something very sad happens to us once we reach about 30 is we start losing lung capacity, just like we start losing bone mass. A woman who's 80 will have half the bone mass as she has when she's like 15. It's crazy. Mm -hmm. So we lose lung capacity too. And this is the one time when we don't want to lose lung capacity. And the great thing is we can lose it if we're irresponsible or we can gain it and reverse that entropy by breathing properly, which is why you see these yogis in their 90s, huge chests, no problems, no diseases, they feel great, and so much of that is tied to the ways in which they breathe. Wow, so imagine uh, imagine we're in person, and we're not on Skype, uh, wish we had soon, but let's see how it goes. So let's say we're there and I can hold my breath for a minute, and I'm in relatively good shape, and you want to get me to two and a half minutes when we're free diving, what would be like the one thing that I could do on land or maybe underwater that would help me get there the furthest in a shorter amount of time? Start engaging your diaphragm more. So, so many of us, I don't know if you spend your life this way. I certainly do in front of a desk, like yeah. eight hours a day. That's just the reality. Now look what happens when even I'm sitting here now I'm hunched over even if I wanted to take a big breath, it would be really hard because my body is hunched and craned over here. So you need to sit up straight first and foremost. And so many of us, and you should not push this. You can probably get away with it. You're, you're a young guy. But a lot of people hear this and they're like, I'm going to expand my, my lungs. I'm going to work. This needs to be low and slow and gentle, just like any muscle. If you've been sitting on the couch for two years, you're not going to go out and run a marathon. You're going to mess yourself up. And that's the exact same thing that's going to happen with your lungs and your diaphragm. Softly, if this is your movement, you know, this week, maybe next week it's going to be down here. Maybe next week it's going to be down here. And softly start taking breaths through your nose 
and engaging your chest. Again, you want that lateral movement. So you can put your hands, I don't know if you can see me, right, right there, uh, bottom two ribs. Breathe in. And you wanna feel your hands going outward, okay? That means you're engaging that diaphragm. It's very important that people don't try to push this and go to zero to 100 in a couple of days acclimate your body just as you would your muscles or anything else. Yeah. Yeah. I was looking at your website and one of the things that struck me was, of course, you said up to 80% of us today are not breathing adequately, which was also shocking news. But you also said that 25% of us suffer from serious over breathing, which I never thought would be a problem. Can you explain kind of the, the I guess, why that would be a problem? Sure. A lot of us think that the more breath we're taking in, the more oxygen we're getting in. So you can go to a gym or you can go outside. I guess gyms don't exist right now. You go outside, people see people jogging, lifting weights, and they're <sighs> really feeling they're getting more, more breath, more oxygen in. They're actually doing the opposite. And this is such a contrarian concept. It took me months to get my head around. When you are over breathing, you're causing stress to your body and you are inhibiting blood flow. So you are offloading too much carbon dioxide. Without carbon dioxide, you are getting vasoconstriction, which is why right now, if you just want to take some heavy, heavy breaths with me, you're going to feel a little lightness in your head. Oh, yeah. Maybe your finger, fingers are going to tingle after a while. You're going to feel cold there. That isn't oxygen getting to those areas. That's oxygen not getting to those areas. Mm. So what you want to do is to breathe as closely in line with your metabolic needs as possible. For the vast majority of us, that means breathing less. By breathing less, you get more oxygen. This is so bizarre, but it's true. I was just talking to Patrick McEwen, world-renowned breathing therapist. He showed me the chart, this chart that, that blew me away. It's if we were to breathe 20 breaths a minute, um, so anything from like 12 to 18 breaths a minute is considered normal. So 20, 20 breaths isn't, isn't that far, and people with anxiety and asthma can breathe a lot more than that. Hmm. Half of that air makes it through our lungs into our bloodstream, half of it. Because when you're breathing that much, you're breathing into the nose, the mouth, the throat, all of this is dead space. There's no gas exchange that happens in the bronchus. So mm. it happens in the lungs. And where the most gas exchange happens is at the bottom of the lungs. That's where most of the blood is. Mm. So by taking these low and slow breaths to halving that level to 12 breaths a minute, which is considered on the lower end of normal, you get about 65 to 70% of that air makes it into the bloodstream. If you have that again, I know there's a lot of numbers, I'm done here, but if you have that again to six breaths a minute, which is considered by medical establishment, highly abnormal, you get 85% of that breath makes it Whoa. into the So you get a 30% increase in oxygen by breathing at a third of the rate. <laughs> wow. Um, and, and these charts are available. Any pulmonologist is going to know this. My father-in-law is a pulmonologist, has been a pulmonologist mm -hmm. for 40 years. And he's like, I've been trying to tell people this for forever, and they don't, they don't believe it, you know. But so what does that work up to? Does it mean that if we were to breathe, I'm wondering, like, at a span of an hour, let's say, or even a day, I guess we could really stretch it out. If you are breathing half the rate and you're getting 65%, versus at the full rate, if it's 50%, does that work out to actually getting more oxygen in, in your body after you do it multiple times throughout the day? Would that work up to more oxygen levels you're getting in? It, it will. If you breathe this slowly, this is, this is the most efficient way of breathing. So you are going to be delivering more oxygen to where, where you need it. Some mm. people who hyperventilate, they could have high blood sats, which, which means they could even be in 96, 97 blood sats. But that oxygen without carbon dioxide can't offload into the tissues. So there's, there's this distinction between the oxygen in our bloodstream and the oxygen that can actually get to feed our cells. And this has been known for 100 years. It's called the Bohr effect. 
And uh, it's still something that seems to just fly under the radar. B O R E? So, yeah, uh, B O H R. A, a bore. Okay, bore. Okay, gotcha, gotcha. Yeah, it's it's true though. I, I I realize though that when I see like UFC fighters or athletes or even myself when I'm running, at a certain point I get so tired and I transition. My body automatically triggers, uh, going from nose breathing to mouth breathing, and I have to consciously, whenever I do consciously, tell myself to breathe through my nose. All of a sudden, my heart beats a little slower. I can I feel like I'm more in flow. Um, but I'm curious to know why our body naturally goes to wanting to breathe with our mouth, especially like when you see like UAC fighters in round four, or round five, that's like a really bad sign for another fighter to know is when they start breathing through the mouth. So wh- why does it, why is that the case for humans who naturally want to go through the mouth? It has to do with uh, sensitivity to carbon dioxide. So the more that you breathe through your nose, the more easily you're going to be able to breathe through your nose. Sometimes we have a uh, obstruction and our noses get stuffed up and we breathe through our mouth. And that's, yeah. that's perfectly normal and perfectly fine on occasion, but habitual na- nasal breathing, just breathing through your nose, a nasal breath, you get 20% more oxygen, just breathing through your nose from the pressure and from nitric oxide release. So they've done so many studies, the studies by Dr. John Duyar um, in the nineties were, were incredible where, you start breathing through your nose, you're going to be breathing less. So you're going to be forcing your heart to, to work less hard. And you want to have a lower heart rate so you can go harder and you can go faster for longer. You don't want your heart rate to be jacked the mm. whole time. So just breathing through the nose is going to calm you down. And, and by having more CO2, also, that's going to affect your heart rate. So what you're experiencing when you breathe through the nose, that flow state, you'll probably feel some more warmth at the back of your neck or your fingers. Mm-hmm. And that is because circulation is increasing and you're getting more oxygen to those areas. So the reason why people um, sometimes switch to mouth breathing is, is because of that. They're, I mean, UFC fighters... <laughs> Eight o'clock in the <laughs> different <nose>. reason. <laughs> and, and that's, so, so, so that's different. But, but what Patrick McEwen and so many breathing therapists have been saying is never work out harder than you can breathe correctly. So mm-hmm. if you're breathing through the mouth and if you're breathing too much, you need to slow it down and stay at that pace and then slowly work yourself up. And once you're able to go as hard as you can breathing through the nose, your heart rate's going to be lower. You're going to have more energy. You're going to have more oxygen, which is going to allow you to just, your potential is going to take off. So he was a trainer for ultra marathoners, basketball teams. I mean, all these high, high end elite athletes. And he said, sometimes it took them weeks, even months to become obligate nasal breathers. And he said their performance could increase by 20, 20%, which for an athlete is enormous and he's got the data on this too so yeah i imagine and and for for anyone really for to be able to be even one percent better you accumulate that over the span of your life just being able to have more oxygen and cleaner oxygen it's it's like a world of difference i imagine yeah and you know people sometimes they switch to mouth breathing they want that turbo boost they can't breathe through through their nose and that's fine for a moment, but it's only going to last so long before you wear yourself out. If your heart heart rate goes goes up 10, 20 beats above where it should be, you know, you, you're just going to suck in, use so much more energy. You should check out the pictures of Sanya Richards-Ross. She was the best sprinter uh, for 10 years going, won all these Olympic gold medals, obligate nasal breather. And check her out when she's at the finish line. All of her mm. competition is And she has this most almost creepy, placid look on her face, lips sealed, breathing from the nose in first place, just destroying everyone else. And and that to me, you know, picture worth a thousand words right there. We'll put that up on the video for sure. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, speaking of just focusing on the nose breathing, I went into I kind of went into the rabbit hole with this, but I initially saw your video. I think his name is Dr. Stephen Park, I believe, is one of the interviews you had in your interview in your website. And he was talking about uh, sleep apnea and, of course, sleeping with sleeping with your uh, with 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 nose breathing. And I, I realized that as much as someone can do this consciously, because I I do I'm more of a nasal breather when I'm conscious, but I 
realize that that when I'm sleeping, I'm actually turning into a mouth breather. I don't know. That's from just from my childhood, just from long back, because I know I'm also a snorer too. Um, so my question is, number one, how does someone know if they're a mouth breather, especially if they're not sleeping with anyone or if they're not sleeping on a friend's couch and they're like getting kicked because they're snoring too much? Is there signs that you can figure out if you're a mouth breather just to get the symptom uh, right in the nail? Yeah, and this is something I never even thought about um, until I met Jayakar Nayak, who's the chief of rhinology research at Stanford. And he asked me a few questions. He's like, do you wake up thirsty a lot throughout the night? Well, I said, well, of course, which is why I have 22 ounces of water. I can't go to bed if I don't have a water bottle with, mm. with water. I'm just hitting it all night. He's like, do you ever wake up tired? You ever Is your mouth ever pasty? I said, well, well, yeah, that's the way it's always been. So you're a mouth breather at, at night. So if we're spending a third of our life breathing through our mouths, we're causing some serious problems for our bodies. So as Stephen Park said, he's a Dr. Albert Einstein Medical Center, an expert in this stuff, such a smart dude when it comes to airway, written some books on it, highly academic. Um, right now, if, if you were to close your mouth, you're going to feel your tongue go forward and go to the roof of your mouth. It's just its natural position. If you open your mouth, what happens? The tongue naturally goes back. So if you are opening your mouth with gravity pushing against your head, guess what's going to happen? Your tongue's going to go back. The soft tissues at the back of your throat are going to loosen, and you are going to... And what can also happen is you can suffer from sleep apnea, which is when your tongue falls back in the throat and clogs it, for about 10 seconds at a time until you go. <laughs> so about a quarter of the population has sleep apnea and they're finding it is so injurious, increases stroke, heart disease, diabetes, autoimmune disease. I mean, I could go down a list of about 20 yeah. problems. And snoring is too. A lot of us think that snoring is this cute thing. Oh, it's like some Dickensian drunk over there snoring away. It causes neurological issues, it causes metabolic issues, and this is exactly what Stephen Park has been talking about for years and years. So no forced breathing is healthy at any time. If you're struggling to breathe, your body is suffering, your body is stout. So what I learned from NIAC, I did this experiment for 20 days uh, with Stanford, with one other subject in the experiment, in which we tested to see what would happen if we just breathe through our mouths for, for 10 days. So about 25 to 50% of the population is a habitually mouth breathes. So the difference here is we were calculating data three times a day. We had a lab set up, CO2, O2, nitric oxide, blood pressure. I mean, everything you could imagine. And within the first night, I went from not snoring or, or snoring a couple minutes a night because I took baselines for weeks to snoring about an hour and a half. Within three wow. days, I was snoring four hours throughout the night. I had sleep apnea, my blood pressure went up 15 points. We were chronically stressed just by mouth breathing. So um, the, the day we shut our mouths at night using a little piece of tape, snoring went away, sleep apnea went away, blood pressure dropped, stress dropped, and all of this is calculated in in data sheets, it wasn't some placebo effect. And it, you know, we're working with Stanford and those guys don't, don't mess around. So just, just by that, and so what a lot of people are doing, just to, now I'm getting to, I know that's a very long-winded way of getting to your answer, but at night, a lot, what a lot of doctors are prescribing now, and this sounds crazy to people, but let me explain, don't go on YouTube and look up sleep, sleep taping, you're gonna see a bunch of garbage. You take a teeny piece of tape, not this blue painter's tape, which I just pulled off my, my wall here because I don't have any proper tape, but micropore tape, surgical tape, and you do this right in the middle of the mouth. I can still talk. I can still cough. <clears throat> I can it's still that big, breathe. though? It's, it's like that tiny of a piece? All you're doing, you're not closing the air off here. You're training the jaw shut because mm. I unfortunately don't have one of those real powerful Clark Kent jaws that naturally stay shut at night. I'm all messed up. I have braces, extractions, and all that. Me too, So man. my mouth, yeah. when I lay down, goes like, and it doesn't need to have to go like this, just a little bit. 
So if you have something there that's just training your jaw shut, don't don't use duct tape or any of that. Just training your jaw shut. That alone I've seen with so many of my friends that it saves some marriages. <laughs> and they've, <laughs> they've, they've calculated this with, with apps to, to not snoring at all. And they've tried everything. You don't hear about it this too often because it's free and there's no way to make money off this. Yeah, yeah. Um, although there are a few products right now that are, they're called sleep tape and they've done studies and they work. So I've seen them. Yeah. Cause the, the thing that I was surprised that it was such a small piece is the ones that I've seen on YouTube, which I guess was not the right place to go is that they've actually covered it all through here. And I saw another one where it's an X mark. So it covers through that mark and i was like shit like what tape do i get now I'm, I'm a little bit confused but it's just like a small piece you're saying yeah so you know people people do the darndest things um they sell this stuff on amazon called somnifix which is somnifix. great if you want to use use that uh it's a big bestseller but what i've found you know some guy i went on youtube he had seven pieces of tape he had a goatee I'm like <laughs> what is going on like you want to have it so at any time you use your tongue to take off this tape. Mm. You don't, you talk about making people anxious, tape up their mouth, they're gonna feel there's some hostage and you know. That's what I thought. Foreign, foreign countries, no. You just wanna train train your mouth to stay shut. Mm. And just, just doing that, I mean, I'm getting literally dozens and dozens of emails from people who have been, been a snorer for 30 years. Why hasn't someone told me this? And, mm. you know, there's probably many reasons. I think it has to do with there's just no way to make anyone to make any money off of that, you know. So it's a capitalistic um, world, right? Yeah. So that's that's the way it is. I mean, you're with Forbes. I shouldn't be saying this too, too loudly. You know, I'm all in for American entrepreneurialism, but uh, there's also easier ways of doing stuff as for well. For sure. For sure. Well, it's interesting. And I've also seen because that was my fear is that if you close your mouth completely shut, my fear was that, OK, I'm usually a mouth breather at night. So if I'm shutting this out, my logical sense is, OK, like, what if I go unconscious? But I have actually read that that's not the case. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, no, nothing. Maybe if you have a fat piece of duct tape, there's a problem. Mm -hmm. In the first few days, you're going to you're going to last five minutes and be like, this is stupid. I'm not doing this. Then a week's gonna go by. You're like, huh? Kind of made it through the night. I've been doing this for a couple of years. I I travel everywhere with this little roll of tape, and me and hundreds of thousands of other people, uh, because I have just I've seen what a dramatic effect it has on my quality of sleep and on my breathing. And the more that you use your nose, the more your nose is gonna open, and the easier it's gonna be to breathe through your nose. It's a use it or lose it organ. We know that. So if you can spend a third of your life just breathing through your nose, it's going to help. Now, you've been doing this for a couple of years now. Do you find that if you were not to use it, let's say you forget one day, do you find that your body has trained itself enough where if you don't use the tape, you can still breathe through your nose without it? That's that's the real hope with a lot of these breathing things. You don't want to become totally neurotic. Oh, I'm breathing seven times a minute, not six times a minute. You know, give, give yourself a break. Uh, start slow, start small, and hopefully these things will become a habit. Habits take a while to establish. I guess, what is it? The common sense is it's three weeks or whatever. Breathing habits take a lot longer. If you've been breathing in an unhealthy way, for 30 years and that's what your body knows it's going to take a while for you to to really adapt to it so yeah. uh you know that's that's the key it's just like like anything else and don't don't give up because it's uncomfortable the first night um i have the the, the change is profound and we saw that with the stanford study you know breathing through your mouth such awful sleep simply putting a piece of tape here so i was breathing through my nose mm. no snow no sleep apnea uh, blood pressure, huge blood pressure drops. I mean, this is, it's it's just so obvious to me, but and yet it's it's too obvious that no one is really paying attention to it. Mm. And you find yourself that when you when you have done that, your quality of sleep and when you wake up, you feel as refreshed, more refreshed than when you were snoring. As a subjective marker, absolutely. But we've done enough data looking at we've worn pulse oximeters before and after and looked at our oxygen levels throughout the night that gauges the amount of blood your your blood sats 
And when you're just breathing through your mouth, it's all over the place. It's really lowering, which is very dangerous, you know, and then it's staying steady and lowering again. This, it's one smooth line the whole way through because you're breathing consistently. And also another thing to note is the nose is where you produce six times more nitric oxide than breathing through the mouth. And a lot of people have been hearing about nitric oxide lately because guess what? They're using it to treat patients with COVID. We make our own oh, nitric oxide. interesting. <laughs> We make our own nitric oxide here. It it plays an essential role in circulation, uh, vasodilation, gas exchange, and it even helps fight off, guess what, viruses and bacteria. It's our first mm -hmm. line of defense. We make so much of that here, and that's another reason why it's so important to breathe through your nose. So it's almost like a filtration system that you go through, and oxygen, obviously, yeah. So if you were to, to cut a human head in half, with the, which a lot of people have done, it looks just, our noses look just like a seashell. So have all of these loops, it's, it's beautiful. You could look it up, the, the terminates or the human nose in, 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 in anatomy, in, in a book, anatomical book or online. And there's all of these little spindles and circles. And, and so our nose and sinuses cover, if, if you had a billiard ball, uh, just a little smaller than a tennis ball, and we're to shove that in front of your face, that's how much space wow. the nose is taking up. So when you breathe, the nose gets filtered, it gets humidified, it gets conditioned, it gets heated up, so by the time it reaches your lungs, it's ready to go into your blood. So this hmm. is our first line of defense, and the fact that 25 to 50% of the population isn't using it, I think uh, is really making them much more susceptible to so many health problems. Wow. Well, I feel like my nose is, isn't like a, it's more like a ping pong because my nose is, so, is a little bit tiny. Does that mean I'm getting less air through, through my body? No. no? And they, they found it's interesting because they found in, in areas where, um, where it's very cold, people evolved to have a bigger nose. So it had more time to heat up in there and areas where it was warm, people would tend to have a flatter nose, but huh. this is just only a very small part of it. You're talking the ethmoid sinuses even go up here. So you have all of these sinuses in here that that air needs to go in. And uh, again, I'd suggest if people are curious, you could even put it up in this, in this chat. Uh, it'll, it'll blow your mind how much space there is and this this labyrinth that air has to run this gauntlet through the nose before it reaches our our lungs and the rest of our bodies wow well for the audio listeners we'll, we'll put this up on youtube so make sure you guys check out the uh the youtube video as well to see the visuals on this but yeah speaking of of uh, smaller noses i mean the the mouth i know you talk about uh in in multiple different areas around how the human skull has evolved and how our our mouth area has becoming smaller and smaller can, can you elaborate a little because i was fascinated just by the visuals uh that you presented in one of your presentations like just to be able to see how our humans have evolved from pre-human species to now can you talk about a little bit more about the evolution of that Sure. And even the human species, how we've evolved, especially in the past 400 years. So it really started maybe a million years ago, a million and a half years ago when we started processing food. People were like, what? We weren't processing food. We were banging prey against rocks to make it easier to chew because chewing raw meat, fatty meat, tendons takes up a lot of energy. So by just tenderizing food, we released more energy in this food. And with that extra energy, those extra calories, we started growing a larger brain, about 50% larger than, than had been before. Then we started cooking. Um, the oldest cooking dates back around 800,000 years ago. That releases even more calories and allows us to chew, chew even less to have even, even more energy to build a larger brain. So if you follow the human brain over the past million years, it just starts growing and growing and growing. So it needed real estate and started taking it from the front of our faces. So if you look at these early human ancestors, they had these huge jaws, huge teeth, which they needed to just chew all day. Yeah. So as we started processing this food, our faces got a little flatter, our nostrils, which used to be up like that, came down this way, and our mouths got a lot smaller. And all of this is fine because these changes happen over hundreds of thousands of years, right? Yeah. So something very interesting happened 
in the past 400 years is we started industrialized food, uh, started taking over uh, the Western world and, and some of the Eastern world as well. So what I mean by that is we started stripping the, the germ and the bran from rice. So we're just eating white rice, which is very soft. Uh, we started stripping the germ and the bran from wheat to making white flour. We started canning things. We started processing things. So we could finally live in a world where we never really had to chew that much. And without that chewing stress, our mouths very quickly grew so small that our teeth had nowhere to go. So they started growing and crooked. So if you look at an ancient skull, anything older than 500 years old, is a very good chance, about a 99% chance, perfectly straight teeth. Wisdom yeah. teeth grew in just fine. If you look at a modern skull, 90% chance, crooked teeth, mouth too small for its faces. I'm a great example of this, you know? Me too. So what happens when you have a mouth that's too small for its face, that teeth don't grow in properly? You have a smaller airway. You have less room to breathe, which is one of the main reasons we have sleep apnea now which is one of the main reasons half of us snore now, which is one of the reasons we have respiratory problems, asthma and allergies, is this mouth, we're literally choking on ourselves. So this was so bizarre, because I had learned that evolution was just survival of the fittest, natural selection only moves forward. All of that is garbage, especially with our species. There's no evolutionary advantage to having your back hurt all the time or to having like a chronic problem like diabetes or mouth too small for its face. So evolution means change. And we've been changing for, for the worse. The good thing is about this is we can change our bodies for the better and we mm -hmm. can start to do this by breathing. Yes. Yeah. I mean, it's, that seems to make sense because humans are the only you know, species that used fire. Like I guess we we're, the, we're the first people that actually get that. And that allowed us to go from beating our prey and then chewing it raw to being able to cook it in, and, and eat it in, in a much softer, softer manner. I even look at even culture that I grew up in, which is like the Asian cuisine, where a lot of what we've eaten is softer food like rice, noodles, soup, like soup is a huge culture, which is basically not even chewing. You're just <laughs> literally swallowing at that point. And I have, along with most Asians, have like a flatter face and smaller mouth in general capacity. Uh, I don't know if that has anything to do with anything, but um, yeah, it's, it's interesting to see the correlation of that. It may not be a causation though. It, it is in, in some ways. Some of these ancient skulls from, from Japan are, are incredible because the very forward growing face, beautiful teeth. And it's, you know, I was looking at ancient skulls at the Archaeology and Anthropology Museum with, with Dr. Mariana Evans. And I was just right when I was beginning this research because I said, this stuff is not true. And she said, well, come on out. And looking at these rows of skulls, they have 800 pre-industrial skulls there. And all of them are just smiling back with these perfect teeth. I was like, what have we done? <laughs> what have we done to ourselves? You know, we're the only species to have chronically crooked teeth. And, and look at any animal in the wild, perfectly straight teeth. Whoa. And they're all habitual nose breathers too. Check out a horse when it's running. Even when it's running at a sprint. Never breathing from its mouth, ever. Dogs do it to thermoregulate. That's why they breathe in their mouth. They're not doing it while they're sleeping. Unless you have a bulldog, which has a messed up face, just like humans. So, <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So it's kind of, yeah, it's interesting because I, you're now seeing, it's been a trend for a while, but you're now seeing all these like uh, biohackers or you've got this community of people that are trying to replace food with things like Soylent, which is something that you just drink throughout the day and it's supposed to have enough vitamins and you know, carbohydrates and all that yeah. stuff and proteins to get you through the day. But what you're saying would pretty much denounce all of the value in that because I, I would not denounce the vitamins and the minerals they, they've done their part, homework. No. Yeah. Perfect yeah, just... caloric intake. And I, I'm in San Francisco. I'm surrounded by these people all the time and they're nootropics and that's great. Anyone can do whatever they want. If they really don't want to sit down and have a meal, and just down a pint of the stuff you know, three times a day. That's totally cool. They're not going to get scurvy and they're not going to get berry berry because they've got all the vitamins figured out. But eating is more than 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 just taking in calories. Right. And just like breathing is more 
than just taking in air. There's other functions to this. When, when you're eating, you're entering a relaxation phase, which allows you to digest food. This is a parasympathetic response, which is why when you chew, you don't chew on both sides of your jaw. You chew on one side. Mm. Like imagine you're eating something really chewy or the other, and that triggers this parasympathetic relaxation response. So I think there's a lot more going on. The, the chewing connection to airways is is absolutely, that's that's already been proven. But I think that there's other things to do with that process of chewing. That's how we evolve to think like in, in the last 10 years, we're like, ah, we don't, our bodies didn't know anything for the past million years. We're, we have this new way of doing this and it's by drinking this goo three times a day. I think that there's gonna probably be some weird side effects from that. It'd be exciting to see what happens. Yeah, so the idea would be that our faces, even in the last 400 years, we've gotten skinnier and we've gotten longer. So it's interesting how that correlates to how an alien looks from the future because their <laughs> brains are bigger, their bodies aren't really there because we don't really need a lot of muscle because everything can be you know, run through artificial bodies. Uh, have you projected with researchers, if we were to look back or look forward to 1,000 years, what the human face would actually look like given how it's been evolving. I've seen it and it's not pretty. It's basically <laughs> like the human face, uh, they've taken ancient skulls and drawn lines on, on their profiles. And almost every ancient skull, like 99% is above this line. Right now, the average human skull is like this. So if we keep going, we're gonna become more and more retronathic. And if we keep having this posture, our heads are gonna go, I mean, look around at a subway, anywhere people looking at their phones, this is a posture which is causing a whole rash of problems onto itself. You're stressing the spine, you're giving yourself a headache. So in a lot of that, even though this seems random, has to do with breathing. Because if you imagine someone administering CPR to someone who's passed out, what's the first thing they do? Mm, they lift yeah. up their neck to open their airway. So people have such chronic problems breathing that they have, this is a theory, by the way, have, have adapted this posture so they can breathe well. And if you mm. see weightlifters, super buff dudes, this is how almost all of them are because they cannot breathe like this anymore. So the good news is, I mean, this is all very depressing stuff. That, that's yeah. why at the beginning of the book, I said, Here's the problem, but the meat of this is how can we fix it? Like our bodies can also heal themselves. And, and that's what to me is what's really exciting and important. I don't want to dwell on the negative too much, which is why I had to identify it early in the book. But, but it's like, okay, we're messed up. Yeah. Let's fix it. And let's, let's listen to experts in the field who have found the science behind how these methods really work. Sure, yeah. I mean, I think it's important to address potential problems just so that it'll at least get people's attention to yeah. take action. But yeah, I would love to focus more on how we can actually improve our breathing and breathing exercises that you've learned and that you do so that we can actually help people take some action around this. And I wasn't talking specifically to you focusing too much on the negative. So don't, don't, don't worry about that. Yeah, my brain goes there. My, what, if, what, if, what if this happens? What if that happens? A little, little offended by that. No, I could talk about that stuff till the cows come home. I love yeah. it because it's fascinating and it's so coming out of left field. Even though the science has been there, people have been researching this literally for a century and no one's been talking about it, which as a reporter was so exciting for me. I was like, well, no one's been talking about it because this stuff can't be real. And then you go to Harvard, then you go to Stanford and they're like, of course it's real. You know, here's here's a book, The Evolution of the Human Head, 600 pages. These are my notes on it right there. It's all there. This guy teaches at Harvard. So um, so anyway, on, on the positive side of this, it's it's important for us to acknowledge that we've been sold this story that our bodies are immutable. And whatever we have, we're, we're stuck with. Totally false. I listened to your program with Wim Hof, quite, mm. a, quite a character there. Yes, he is. Um, but um, the automatic, autonomic nervous system, for instance, so many of us are living our lives in this chronic state of low-grade stress, 
right? So we're, we're never quite resting, but we're never like running away from a bear or fighting for our lives. That state of low grade stress has been uh, directly correlated to the vast majority of, of chronic diseases that are killing people from stroke to metabolic issues to heart issues. I mean, I could go, go on down the, the list. So the idea is that the autonomic nervous system is called autonomic, as in automatic, as in beyond our control, can't control it. Totally false. You can absolutely control it. And guess how you can control it? By breathing. So right now, if you take your hand, place it over your heart, you're going to take a breath in to about three. Then we're going to try to exhale very slowly to about 10. So let's take a breath in. Now exhale very slowly to about 10. You're going to feel your heart rate lowering, okay? You're going to feel yourself become, becoming more and more calm. What's that that's doing? It's, it's not a placebo effect, okay? That is you eliciting a parasympathetic response in your body. So each inhale is associated with more of a active sympathetic response. Each exhale is associated with a parasympathetic response. So if you just extend your exhales a little more than your inhales, it doesn't matter what pattern you do this in. You can breathe into the count of four, exhale to six. You're gonna keep your body, you're gonna help keep your body in that parasympathetic state where you're gonna increase your circulation to your organs, you're gonna lower your heart rate, you're gonna lower your blood pressure, you're gonna allow your body to do a lot more with a lot less, which is exactly what you wanna do. You don't wanna force your body into unnecessary wear and tear. Why would you mm -hmm. wanna do that? But so many of us are doing this all day. So even if your day is hectic, there's 40 people yelling at you, you've got 20 emails in, you can use your breathing to dial down your body's functions. So you're, you're not able to control like your liver function or your kidney function or your stomach consciously, but you can consciously control your breath. When you consciously control your breath, you can influence all these functions in different ways. I think that is so fascinating. And breath I is something so. that, that we carry with us all the time. So you can use this at any time and just... As you were doing this, you just did that for a couple breaths, right? You probably felt a little more relaxed, probably felt your heart rate lowering. Imagine if, so you're feeling that within a few seconds. Imagine if you're doing that for a few hours a day or a few days out of the week or a few weeks out of the month, a few months out of the, what's your body going to do? How is your body going to respond to that? Well, we've seen these people overcoming autoimmune diseases, overcoming incurable problems by shifting their breathing and allowing their bodies to naturally heal, heal themselves. Mm. Yeah, now I know, I know what people are thinking, which is when you're listening to an episode like this, it's probably easy to do it on the spot with the host, with the guest, but do you have any tips or apps or tricks so that people can remind themselves to do it more constantly? Sure, sure. so the, the way that I set up the book is like the middle part of it is just the stuff that anyone can do. It doesn't matter if you're an elite athlete, doesn't matter if you're an asthmatic. So breathing slower, breathing through the nose, exhaling, breathing less. These are all things that you can do. You can do this by various means. That's the foundation. And then towards the end of the book, I was looking, where can breathing take us? The potential of taking control of our nervous system, immune function and all that. So whenever I sit down, uh, which I do every, every morning and look at all these emails, it's just like, oh my God, how am I going to get through all this? My breathing goes to crap, and I know this because I've worn a pulse oximeter and watched how stilted my oxygen levels be become. They're just all over the map. So what I do sometimes is I use a free app called Pace Breathing. You can use a zillion different apps, and I set it, and it has this nice little cool tone that goes, Ooh, and I put it real quiet, and I put it right next to my desk, and it just reminds me to breathe this way. I can work as just as I was working before, but to start off your day, instead of being stressed, being, I can't believe this idiot was replying all to me again. I'm going to kill him. You know, you can take control of some of that stress by taking control of our breathing. And, and again, this is not some placebo effect. You can, this is a measurable effect that's, wow. that's happening to your body. So that's how I start off my days, but I'm gotcha. weird. Um, no, this is <laughs> useful. <laughs> 
you shouldn't you, need to use this one once, once you become aware of it and that's why awareness is the number one thing once you become aware then you won't need this but but mm -hmm. i find especially when i get stressed out um i like to do that so you just keep it on throughout your day it's not distracting it's almost like a white background noise that you keep on exactly and maybe i'll have it on for 10 minutes maybe i'll have it on for longer just to sort of set that pace if you're breathing this way everything is locking in in just the way it should and if someone has a heart rate variability monitor these are very hip breathe in six six seconds in six seconds out and check out what happens to your hrv all these lines that were like this become these beautiful sine waves um because that is your nervous system working at peak efficiency. So to get, I also do some some more vigorous breathing methods. I'm a big fan of, of Wim and what he's doing and Tumo, even though that is, he calls it Wim Hof method. That stuff's been around for thousands of years. He's admitted that too. Um, but these other breathing methods that I call breathing plus, and this sounds weird to people, they uh, purposely elicit stress. So you breathe in ways to stress your body out specifically so you can spend the other 23 and a half hours of the day resting and relaxing which is how we've evolved to be right um, and i've found these are extremely powerful uh sudar shankriya is great wim hof tumo's great uh different pranayamas are great they all go by these different names they all do the same thing so you yep. can pick and choose what works for you but 20 minutes of that uh, it, it's been a real life changer for me. And it's wonderful to see studies coming out. Two studies just came out at Harvard and at Yale, a separate study at Yale, showing how effective this was for stress, anxiety, and depression. Wow. Yeah. I mean, I've been, it's something that I want to do certainly throughout the day, but spe spe specifically more of a deeper exercise routine during the morning when I first wake up, because the idea oh. is like, I want to alkalinize my body and I use like lemon and, and green smoothie, but it sounds like just getting enough breathing in is going to alkalinize my body more than anything. Oh my God. Yeah. I mean, for, for sure. And the, you know, there's a lot of debate on how acidic the food is. If that really makes your blood alkaline. I, from what I've seen, there's sort of a dearth of research into that, but breathing right now, <sighs> I'm making my bot my pH alkaline. It's the quickest thing. It's the quickest means to do that. Mm -hmm. So there's this guy, Chuck McGee. He runs a breathing uh, session on Monday nights, Pacific time. It's free. No one's selling anything. He does it because breathing's changed his life. He was a type one diabetic. He had anxiety. He had high blood pressure. He was on all these drugs for all this stuff. He's quit them all, 80% less insulin now by focusing on his breathing. So mm -hmm. this guy is a true saint because he's not, you know, there aren't ads coming up while you're doing this. He's there, he wants to help. And that's a great introduction for people. Uh, then he sends out the recordings and I have about four of his recordings on here and that's what I do. Um, how I how have, do people access that? Uh, he is available at, uh, I put it on my site, social media a few times. He's gone from having about five people in these sessions. The last one was 400, which is so awesome. People from all over the world are doing it. Uh, and it's totally free. So you can look up. He has the posting on a meetup. He is, um, and and that's, uh, you know, one of those sites where you have to log in. But uh, the the Zoom link I've put on my social media a few times. I'll try to find it, yeah. Uh, and you could you could put it up there for for everyone. And the, the gift of this is not only doing it live, it's to have the recording and to be able to wake up in the morning and do this. You will feel very very different than than you would if you hadn't. Beautiful, beautiful. Well, James, thank you so much for for making the time to to come on and and to share your knowledge. Uh, I'm curious to know um, if you were to give one actionable advice for something small that people can do right now right after this what would that be i would have to go to just for five minutes today it's not asking too much you can be working while you're doing this set your phone and breathe at a pace i call it 5.5 .5 seconds that's the beautiful thing because you want 5.5 .5 liters of air it doesn't matter if it's five or six seconds just something in the ballpark breathe in to a count of about five or six breathe out to a count of about five or six don't force it should be extremely relaxed. Set your phone. Do that for five minutes. The worst thing that can happen to you 
is you're going to feel a lot better. But there's also a bunch of other things that are going to be happening inside your body as well. And uh, this is something we can carry with us. It's free and it's open to everyone. That's another thing I really love about breathing. Beautiful, beautiful. We'll be sure to link out all of your social links. All the, the, I know you have multiple books that you've written as well. Uh, where is the best people to find you online, social media? Can you sure. uh, let us know? It's uh, Mr. James Nestor. Um, some jerk took James Nestor, so I had to put an MR in front of that. So <laughs> I'm awful at social media. I'm trying to get better. Uh, I'm on Instagram, Facebook, my website, mrjamesnestor.com backslash breath. Free um, breathing videos, 500 free scientific references. If you don't believe this stuff, you can, you can check it out yourself. And some expert Q and A's with, with doctors in the field who answer questions about breathing. Yeah, I got a lot of info just by looking at that. So I highly recommend people to check it out. All right, James, thanks so much for tuning in. Thank you guys so much for tuning in. Make sure you guys subscribe, leave a rating, and check out James's book, his website, and everything that you're doing. Thank you again for tuning in. And we'll see you next week.